Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jay Kumar Radhakrishnan. I'm a theoretical computer scientist. I work at ICTS. Uh, welcome to ICTS. Um, we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Uh, Aranyo uh, Bhattacharya with us. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya is a science writer who has worked at The Economist and Nature. Before journalism, he was a medical researcher at uh, Burnham Institute in San Diego. He holds a degree in physics from the University of Oxford and a PhD in protein crystallography from Imperial College London. He's the author of a new book, uh, The Man from the Future, that describes the visionary life of the extraordinary John von Neumann. Uh, at an event at the Indian Institute of Science yesterday, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya was at pains to emphasize that this is not a usual biography, but a book built around the various visions of von Neumann and their relevance today. I will let him explain what this book is about and why it came to be written. Before that, let me thank uh, several people who made this event possible. Uh, Professor K. Vijay Raghavan, our colleague and a friend of the Institute, uh, a former uh, principal scientific advisor of the government of India, suggested that we host uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, and we are delighted to be given this opportunity. Uh, this event has been accommodated in an ICTS program. Uh, the name of the program is Turbulence, Problems at the Interface of Mathematics and Physics. Uh, this is where we might have located von Neumann uh, before computers uh, at the interface of mathematics and physics. I thank the organizers of the program for making space for us. I thank all of you for coming here and the others who have joined us uh, on live stream over the internet. Finally, thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya, for agreeing to speak to us and to interact with us after your talk, Dr. Bhattacharya. Right. <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, welcome to my talk on the man from the future, uh, an intellectual biography of John von Neumann. Now, I can't promise you'll like the book. I hope you do, and I hope you read it. And more importantly, I hope you buy it. But um, what I can promise you is that it's not going to be quite like any other book you've ever read. So I call it an intellectual biography. Um, and that's because it's von Neumann's ideas rather than his life that are really center stage in the book. Um, and we followed them from the early 20th century right through to the present day and maybe beyond. Um, you could look at it as a sort of hidden history of the 20th century. So a lot of conventional histories of the 20th century, the Second World War, for example, or computing or the Cold War, they all leave out this key thread that actually helps make sense of it all. And that key thread is mathematics. And the person that dreams up the maths, that, that connects up so much of the 20th century and, and our century too, is this remarkable Hungarian-American mathematician, um, a genius, John von Neumann. Right. So uh, Janos von Neumann, as he was known, was born in 1903 to a wealthy Jewish family in Budapest. And he died in 1957 in Washington, D.C. He was the eldest of three brothers. And um, I'd like to say you can always spot the troublemakers uh, from uh, an early age. And that's him staring out into the camera, of course. Um, so most of his working life was spent at the Institute 
for advanced study in Princeton, where he was one of the first recruits along with um, his more famous colleague, Einstein. Uh, at the time, von Neumann was almost as famous as Einstein though, and people who knew them both, um, they said that von Neumann's mind was far sharper than Einstein's and unimaginably faster than anyone else's. Um, so he was a sort of genius's genius. Um, everyone was in awe of him. Um, unlike many other brilliant mathematicians though, von Neumann was never gonna be happy cooped up in an ivory tower proving theorems. He wanted to be out in the real world, applying his mathematical mind to practical problems. And what I argue in my book is that more than 70 years after his death, the full impact of his ideas are only now beginning to be felt. As a child, um, von Neumann could speak ancient Greek at five. He could multiply eight digit numbers together in his head at six, uh, supposedly. And he knew calculus by the age of eight. Um, his first serious maths paper uh, was written when he was 17 years old, and it's still considered a classic uh, today. And it was on an area of maths called set theory. Um, and I may be preaching to the choir a little bit for some people, so uh, you may, sorry, uh, you'll have to excuse me about that. Um, so for those not in the know, set theory allows you to talk about groups of things. And more importantly for mathematicians, it allows you to talk about infinitely large groups of things. And that's key because in maths, um, you don't wanna prove a theorem about just a few numbers, right? Um, if it's a theorem about prime numbers, you've got to have it apply to all prime numbers and, and there are infinitely many of those. Now, at the time, uh, worrying paradoxes were beginning to appear in set theory. And it was von Neumann's early work on fixing these paradoxes, which would make his reputation at the time as a mathematician of the first rank. So what were these paradoxes? Well, uh, they concern sets of infinite size. Specifically, when mathematicians started uh, running into problems is when they started thinking about the properties of the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. So where's the paradox there? Well, if the set of all sets that are not members of themselves is not a member of itself, well, then it should be because it's not a member of itself. But if it is a member of itself, well, then it shouldn't be because then it would be a member of itself. Um, now the non-mathematicians can think about that one later, but for the rest of us, it's basically a mathematical version of the liar's paradox, which is this statement is a lie. Now, you know, if that's, true, it's false. And if it's false, it's true. Now, this all might seem quite a silly thing for grown men and grown women to be worrying about. But these paradoxes were causing huge ructions in mass. Um, and after all, if you think about it, if you can't talk meaningfully about infinities, then you can't do any serious maths. And if you can't do maths, you can't do science because the language of science ultimately is maths. And solving this problem, which was stumping many of the greatest minds of his time, this is the task that von Neumann modestly sets himself for his PhD, which he started straight after high school. Uh, and by the time he's 19, he has a draft. And in that, he recrafts set theory to avoid these sorts of paradox. Um, the thing is, that wasn't all he was up to. Von Neumann's father, Max, who was a, an investment banker, very practical-minded man, 
had insisted that he study something practical as well as his maths PhD. So von Neumann was also busy swatting up on chemistry at the University of Berlin. And he was also studying for a chemical engineering degree at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. Now it's worth saying that he sat the same entrance exam that uh, Einstein would fail a few years later. Um, now, so how, how did von Neumann resolve the crisis that was stumping so many older mathematicians? Well, in simple terms, he was very, very rigorous about his definitions. In his version of set theory, you can't really talk about a set of all sets anymore. So you can't tie yourself in these sorts of logical knots um, when you start dealing with infinitely large groups of things. And this thesis that he produced at 19, it sets the tone for much of his future work. What he would do is he would, um, he would just take a seemingly intractable complex problem and then reduce it to its bare logical essentials. And then he'd sort of bulldoze his way through it. And as you'll see, this sort of marks his work um, all the way through his career pretty much. Anyway, von Neumann wrapped up his PhD at 22. And naturally, he heads to the best mathematics department in the world. And in the 1920s, that is the one that is headed by David Hilbert at the University of Göttingen. So the 22 year old arrives in 1926, and he finds that there's another whiz kid there called Werner Heisenberg. And Heisenberg is actually a year older than von Neumann. It was a pretty incredible time. So Heisenberg had been busy formulating a new science called quantum mechanics, um, which was an attempt to describe physics at the scale of the atom. Now von Neumann's drawn to this new science and he begins trying to make sense of the maths behind it. But there's a, a problem. Within months of Heisenberg publishing his version of quantum mechanics, there's another version of it by Erwin Schrödinger. And while Heisenberg's version of quantum mechanics sort of seemed to, it was based on matrices, and it seemed to imply electrons hopping about inside atoms uh, from orbit to orbit, Schrödinger's is based on waves. And these two versions gave the same answers, but they looked really different, both mathematically and about what they seem to be saying about the underlying nature of reality. Now, von Neumann's first contribution to quantum mechanics was to show that mathematically speaking, um, these two different looking versions of quantum mechanics were actually both two sides of the same coin. And he carried on working on quantum mechanics uh, for the next uh, decade or so. And this work uh, culminates in a book called Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics, which would be the first really rigorous take on the new science. And even now, some of the questions that scientists ask around quantum mechanics, like, will we ever build a quantum computer um, those questions, the slightly more philosophical questions, are rooted in von Neumann's maths from nearly a century ago. So after a year at Göttingen, um, von Neumann's offered a job at the University of Berlin. And in 1927, he becomes the youngest lecturer they had ever appointed. He was 23. Um, soon, though, he senses that there is trouble ahead in Europe, and pretty soon in his letters to um, his friends and uh, other mathematicians, he's writing that there is another world war coming, and he, he senses this very early on. And he decides not to linger in Europe, and he, is, he goes to Princeton after they offer him a position with a, with a huge salary. And he arrived in the USA in January 1930. 
and his school friend, the physicist Eugene Wigner, who's a future Nobel Prize winner. Um, um, and actually some of the work that Wigner did was, uh, he did in collaboration with von Neumann. Um, so Wigner had also been offered a job at Princeton, though it turned out on a, at a much lower salary. Um, they wanted uh, von Neumann, but they invited Wigner so that he wouldn't feel lonely. Now, they both arrived in America more or less together, and the two men agreed uh, to Americanize their name shortly afterwards. So uh, Jano Wigner uh, became Eugene, and Janos von Neumann became John, or more often in America, it was Johnny. So Johnny was accompanied by his uh, new wife, uh, Marriott Cavesi, who was a childhood sweetheart. Um, and he'd married her just days before their voyage to America. And uh, it wasn't an auspicious start to the wedding, unfortunately, because she was violently seasick on the way over. But they enjoyed Princeton um, tremendously. And uh, in this picture, you can, yeah, you can see von Neumann there. And uh, that's not his wife sitting on his lap, by the way. Um, uh, in fact, that, oh, that, uh, that is somebody else altogether. Um, Marriott sitting, I think, on Wigner's lap. Yes, that's Marriott on Wigner's lap. Um, so you can tell that there was quite a bit of drinking and jollity going on there. So Princeton didn't have the cafes and bars where that they were used to, where European intellectuals like to spend so much of their time. So Marriott began hosting these salons at their home. And as the von Neumanns became wealthier and they moved to a grander house in Princeton, the parties became grander and more ra raucous and more drunken. And those parties would soon become a thing of Princeton legend, where towards the end of the evening, eminent professors could be found rolling around the floor drunk, kind of like this one here on the, on the floor here. So, um, Von Neumann's taste for fast cars was legendary, and uh, he never passed a driving test. In fact, they bribed the driving instructor to get him a license, as did his wife. So his driving skills, or rather the lack of them, were pretty legendary too. And at Princeton, an intersection was pretty quickly named Von Neumann's Corner, still there today, because of the many, many smash-ups that he had there. Um, on 6th March 1935, Marriott gives birth to John von Neumann's only child, uh, Marina, who is uh, still with us today. And um, yeah, there they are um, in the Midwest um, when she was uh, 11 years old. Um, so Marina told me that uh, maths was never her strong suit. Um, but that didn't prevent her from becoming a professor of economics and uh, vice president at General Motors. So there's hope uh, for us all, I think. Um, and here she is again, and she would be the first woman to serve under Nixon on the President's Council of Economic Advisors. And she uh, resigned uh, shortly, uh, I think, before Watergate or after Watergate, I forget. Um, so the von, von Neumanns should have been happy, right? They had every reason to be happy. They were rich. Von Neumann has accepted a job at the Institute for Advanced Study, which uh, the envious um, academics and professors at Princeton call the Institute for Advanced Salaries. Um, he started on uh, $10,000 a year, which uh, is close to $200,000 today. And this was in depression era America. So you can imagine the kind of resentment that stirred. Um, and, and this was a junior salary. This is a junior professor's salary because Einstein got paid more. Um, but not everything was going well at home. And in 1937, Marriott left Johnny for a young physicist named Warner Cooper. And uh, and uh, her daughter tells me that the reason was that she was tired of playing second fiddle to mathematics, basically, to von Neumann's constant thinking about mathematics. Um, Marriott would become a pretty formidable science administrator herself, and she was instrumental in establishing the Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island. 
Von Neumann would remarry quite quickly, though, to another Hungarian, Clara Dan. This is her here on her French um, driving, oh no, a French uh, ID card. And she was another Hungarian from a wealthy Jewish Budapest family. And we'll meet her again later for some uh, very special reasons. Von Neumann had by this time started looking at the maths of optimizing explosions. And uh, I suspect there are people in the audience who are gonna know quite a bit more than me about that. But uh, uh, for uh, <laughs> the non-experts on nonlinear dynamics and so on, it's literally how to get the biggest bang for the military's buck. Um, so he quick, quickly makes himself indispensable because remember he knows that there is a war coming and he makes himself indis indispensable to the US military and the government there. And soon he's consulting the army, the air force and the navy. Um, he also makes the acquaintance of a scruffy young English gentleman um, by the name of Alan Turing, who was something of a Johnny fan. Um, Turing had in fact asked for a copy of von Neumann's book on quantum mechanics um, as a teenager for his prize for winning a school math competition and Turing read it in the original German. Uh, so that's dedication for you. I found it hard going in English, I should say. Um, and von Neumann, you know, in one of the many strange and interesting connections that run through the book, von Neumann would provide a letter of recommendation for Turing so he could come to Princeton as a visiting fellow. And Turing would stay in Princeton for two years to do a PhD, not under von Neumann, but um, uh, von Neumann got him there. And von Neumann eventually offered him a position as an assistant, but Turing refused and he returned to England in 1938. And that is a story um, that I don't think I need to tell you about what happened next. So um, in 1943, von Neumann is sent to England on a top secret mission for the Royal Navy. We still don't really know what he was up to, we know that he helped out with um, the German subs bombing patterns, so their mine laying patterns, um, and he solved that pretty quickly. And, he sh and uh, as a result, he, he saved a lot of ships uh, from the British Navy from being sunk by the Germans. Um, what we do know is that he visited the Nautical Almanac office in Bath, and this is where he saw this thing in action. And this is the National Cash Register accounting machine. And this was a mechanical calculator that could do a lot more than add up. It was in effect a sort of early primitive mechanical computer. And this appears to have fired up von Neumann's long-standing interest in computing machines. And he wrote a program for it on the train back to London. Von Neumann's wartime mission was interrupted when Robert Oppenheimer writes to him. And uh, Oppenheimer begs him to join what he calls a somewhat Buck Rogers project. Um, and of course the Buck Rogers project turned out to be the massive secret American effort to build the atom bomb at Los Alamos. Now I, I think I don't need to tell anybody in the audience who this is. Everybody knows who these people are? No? Yes? That's von Neumann. Who's this? Feynman and bonus points. You know who it is. <laughs> I think you read the book. That's Stan, Stan Ulam, who was um, Adventures of a Mathematician. His, uh, his biography was made into a film recently, but he's, he's one of the, well, one of the outstanding minds of the 20th century as well. So um, uh, he, and he was one of von Neumann's best friends. So, um, so von, Neumann, von Neumann did join um, the project and he was instrumental in designing the more powerful implosion bomb. And this was the type that was used in the Trinity test and in Fat Man, the bomb that was detonated over Nagasaki. And this was a far more difficult feat of engineering than the other bomb, which was called a gun type device. Um, and you know, the gun type device, it just fired one piece of uranium at another, and that made a critical mass 
and you had an explosion. Um, but the implosion bomb was, was something different. Um, some of the scientists at Los Alamos compared the, the, the implosion bomb problem um, to squashing in a can of beer without spilling a drop. Um, and they, they'd almost given up on it as hopeless. Now the answer von Neumann worked out quite quickly actually, within 24 hours of arriving, he'd formulated um, the solution to this problem that uh, the answer was to arrange explosives. He was an expert in explosives by this time around the core in the shape of a truncated icosahedron. You know, that's a modern football, but of course the footballs then look nothing like, like that. Um, and, and the reason that works is um, it creates a spherical wavefront that, um, that crushes um, the, uh, uh, the um, well, it, it was plutonium, I think, in the end, um, evenly from all sides. And the, the gun type weapon would never have worked with, with plutonium. So uh, plutonium would just have fizzled, it was too reactive. So they, they needed this. And this was, um, this was basically what the Americans used as an, an initial assembly line. Um, of bombs after the Second World War. So, um, so at the end of uh, at the end of that, at Los Alamos von Neumann was asked to find more resource, resources for bomb related calculations. So he starts crisscrossing America in search of more computational power. Now, in the summer of 1944, completely by accident, whilst he's waiting for a train. Von Neumann met the mathematician Hermann Goldstein. And he discovers that Goldstein is working on this remarkable device, a massive room filling computer called the ENIAC. There we are. Now, the ENIAC was the brainchild of John Maudsley, who was a former physics teacher, and Presper Eckert who was um, an electronics whiz kid and the son of a local uh, property tycoon. And the ENIAC would be one of the world's first fully electronic digital, digital computers. But like all the computers of the time, it was designed for just one job. And that was to calculate artillery trajectories. And this was a huge problem in the First World War. And it was a problem again in the Second World War. And the problem is if you fire off uh, a mortar shell. You want to know where it's going to land under different conditions, you know, uh, depending on, on where you're firing from and where you're trying to get to. So if you like, it was a very early version of Angry Birds. Now, all of these very early computing machines were designed to do one thing really well. And if you wanted them to do something else, you had to rewire them. It was like an old sort of telephone switchboard that you had to um, un unplug. And as we know, modern computers don't work this way at all, right? You don't have to do that with your iPhone, thankfully, every time um, you want to open a new app. So when von Neumann joined the ENIAC project, he quickly understood its limitations and he wanted a more flexible sort of computer, something that could be programmed to carry out any task without having to be rewired. So in 1945, he writes a really stripped down logical description of what a machine like that would have to look like. And the design and the design he describes in this report, which is called the EDVAC report, it quickly became the standard for computers right down to the present day. And even now, practically every computer that you're likely to meet, unless you work on quantum computers or ma massively parallel computers or something, um, including you know, the, uh, the phones in our pockets, they're all based on his design, uh, which is called the von Neumann architecture. Shortly after the EDVAC report, von Neumann started getting funding to build his own computer at the Institute for Advanced Study. But that project gets rather bogged down and it goes more slowly than he was hoping. Um, and with Los Alamos pressing him to get more and more computing power, he hits on the idea of converting the ENIAC into a sort of primitive modern stored program computer. And it's his second wife who I showed you earlier, Clara Dan. Well, she actually does the job together with the Los Alamos physicist, Nicholas Metropolis and a gang um, who, uh, of mostly women 
who were involved with uh, sort of rewiring the ENIAC and programming it um, to begin with. So they rewire the ENIAC in 1948. And from then on, the ENIAC can store and run any program just like a modern computer. And it's never rewired into any other con configuration after that. So Clara Dan also writes the first programs for it in this new setup. And these programs are arguably the first ever modern computer program ever to run on any computer. And uh, these have been uh, relatively recently discovered by historians in the last sort of five, 10 years or so, uh, dug up from the archives. And this is a photo of her original handwritten code. And we know that it's in her handwriting. So you're looking at the code for simulating a nuclear chain reaction inside an atom bomb, right? And I'd just like to put this in context briefly because the uh, Manchester baby is often recognized as being the first programmable computer that we, that we know about. But the Manchester baby ran its program weeks after this, right? Um, and the Man all the Manchester baby did was factorize a very large number. I think it had something like 30 steps in it. This was the first computer simulation and it was used to plug in data to design an atom bomb, okay? These are vastly different tasks. So I would argue that uh, Clara Dan um, really um, has uh, first dibs um, on uh, the modern computer program. So uh, here's the team that helped uh, von Neumann build uh, his computer at the Institute for Advanced Study. And this finally roars into life in 1951. Just a few years later, IBM unveiled its 701, its first commercial computer, and it's more or less a carbon copy of von Neumann's machine at the IAS. And that's not a coincidence because IBM had paid von Neumann a lot of money to be a consultant for them. And he's the one that helped them move from being a mechanically orientated company to being an electronic digital company. And again, you can see there he is at the beginnings of history, just sowing his seeds and moving on. Sorry? Uh, I don't think von Neumann's in that picture, actually. Let's have a look. Um, if he would be, he'd be at the back. Now, that's just his team. I don't think he's in that picture. Um, all right, yeah, there's... Oh. Oh, my time's run out. <laughs> it's okay, I'll, ca I'll carry on, sorry. I think we started a bit later, I'll try and speed up. Okay, as a hobby between working on the atom bomb and bringing the modern computer into being, von Neumann's also busy inventing game theory. Uh, and yeah, there we are. And he, here he is with the economist, Oscar Morgenstern. Um, so in between trips to Los Alamos, he meets with Morgenstern in Princeton to hash out game theory, which is a new mathematics of conflict and cooperation. And their book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, was finished in April 1943, and it weighs in at more than 600 pages. It was supposed to be about economics, but coming as it did at the dawn of the Cold War, game theory's first application would be to question would be to questions about nuclear deterrence, and um, most of that work will be done at the RAND Corporation, an influential defense think tank, which is based um, in Santa Monica. And it's still there today. And a lot of American nuclear policy during the Cold War would be shaped there. And von Neumann joins RAND as a consultant in 1948. So, and RAND itself became a sort of who's who of game theorists and pretty much all the big names of the field passed through its doors at some point including some of those who would win Nobel Prizes a few decades later. And it would also be the birthplace of the most notorious game to ever come out of game theory, and that was The Prisoner's Dilemma, which uh, many of you may have heard of. Economists, on the other hand, were pretty slow to adopt game theory. It was only in 1994, 50 years after the publication of von Neumann and Morgenstern's Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, the game theorists were awarded the Nobel Prize in economics for the first time, including John Nash, who you may have heard of. Um, he of a beautiful mind, but don't believe that film. 
read the book. Um, uh, that same year, um, auctions designed by game theorists were also used to sell off chunks of the radio spectrum to telecoms firms, and this made billions for the American government. Nowadays, game theory is much more likely to be making billions for tech titans like Google and Amazon through auctions that sell keywords for online ads. Despite consulting for Rand, von Neumann's interest in game theory really begins to wane by the late 1940s. He can never um, sit still in any place uh, long enough, really. By this time, he's far more interested in computers and more specifically, he's interested in computers that can birth more computers. Yep, 300 years earlier, when the philosopher René Descartes had told his student um, that he believed the body to be nothing but a machine, his student, who was the uh, very cocky and intelligent 23-year-old Queen Christina of Sweden, she answered, well, I never saw my clock making babies. And um, what von Neumann did was to show mathematically that clocks could indeed make babies. His theory of self-reproducing automata proved that for the first time. And they proved the machines could grow, reproduce, and evolve over time. And there were three things that anything needs to make copies of itself, von Neumann said. First, a set of instructions that detail how to build a replica. Second, it needs machinery to do the work construction unit, and third, some way of creating a copy of the instructions and inserting it into the new machine. Now, this was five years before the discovery of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick. But we now know that every organism more complex than a virus has an instruction set in the form of DNA, cell machinery to turn that code into meat and bones and other stuff, and enzymes to copy the DNA code. Um, von Neumann later described a sort of tube of dimensional machine that could reproduce itself. And he described this on paper. And it lives, this creature lives on this endless grid. And each square of the grid could be in one of 29 states and communicates with its immediate neighbors. And what von Neumann showed was that starting with a very, very complex configuration of these squares, it was possible to create something that automatically continue to make copies of itself. And it would take nearly 50 years to show that von Neumann's automaton could in fact reproduce without a hitch. And the first simulation of von Neumann's machine in 1994, um, well, by the time the academics submitted the paper, um, their machine was still reproducing. Um, it took over a year. On a modern laptop though, it takes minutes. And here it is. Um, so von Neumann's automata theory would eventually inspire ideas about everything from nanotech robots to 3D printers that can print their own parts from moon bases to self-replicating spacecraft for exploring the galaxy, but he wouldn't live to see any of it. On 9th July, 1955, von Neumann collapsed at home. He's diagnosed with bone cancer and rushed to hospital for emergency surgery. Uh, by the end of the year, he's in a wheelchair and uh, anybody that's seen Dr. Strangelove may recognize the caricature of von Neumann there. So by the following March, von Neumann's admitted to hospital again. And as he lay in his hospital bed, he was writing his last legendary lectures comparing the computer and the brain. And these lectures would build the first bridge between neuroscience and computer science. And that's in place today. Um, he left hospital just once to accept the Medal of Freedom from President Eisenhower. Um, von Neumann died on 8 February, 1957. His best friend, uh, the mathematician Stan Ulam, who probably understood the breadth of von Neumann's ideas best and wrote about him in his memoirs, um, he said, von Neumann, he died so prematurely, he saw the promised land, but hardly entered it. And I'd argue that more than 60 years after his death, we're just beginning to glimpse von Neumann's promised land for ourselves. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, before I uh, invite uh, 
questions from the audience. I will uh, claim the privilege of holding the mic myself and ask the first question. Uh, so uh, reading your book and uh, listening to your talk um, and the enormous breadth uh, of uh, von Neumann's uh, activities, one cannot, uh, uh, one is reminded of another parallel life of a 20th century mathematician. Uh, he was born in 1903, the same year as von Neumann. Uh, he was interested in history, and your book says that professors of Byzantine history would avoid bringing up the subject when von Neumann was around, because he was such an expert on the subject. So this mathematician uh, talked about land holding patterns in Novogrod Empire, which ran from 12th century to the 15th century in parallel with Byzantine Empire. And then he was interested in intuitionistic logic. His mathematics uh, abilities were established, I mean, when he was very young, he traveled to Gottingen in 1930. He wrote a book called The Fundamentals of the Theory of Probability. And he worked on many, many areas. And uh, yeah, so probability theory, topology, intuitionistic logic, turbulence, classical mechanics, evolutionary genetics, algorithmic information theory, and computational complexity. Uh, when the statistician, American statistician Wolfowitz uh, went to the USSR, he said he went there with the specific purpose of finding out whether A.N. Kolmogorov was a man or an institution. Okay. Now, but there are differences, and I would like to ask a question based on that. Uh, Kolmogorov had descendants. Gelfand, Dinkin, Sinai, Arnold, Dobrushin, uh, Prohorov, Den Den Denko. Uh, among his students are Fields medalists, Nobel laureates, Abel Prize winners, Turing Award winner. Now, von Neumann, we don't know much about von Neumann's engagement with students, probably because he did not hold a university position maybe after 1930. So, have you? Uh, during your researches, uh, researchers found something about his development of science in this dimension, that is setting up a school of thought which carried on beyond him. Right. I, 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 well, uh, the young of the book is sort of historically, um, he came at a, a key juncture um, and he was almost uniquely kind of qualified at the time to span all of these different fields. And, you know, he's often been accused of neglecting pure mathematics. So mathematicians were very sniffy. And at the IAS, they were very sniffy about his, you know, computer projects, who, you know, what self-respecting mathematician would dabble in computers? Gosh, um, but I think you, yeah, you, you, could, you would like to talk about Helmholtz. But uh, he was, he did write papers with Birkhoff, uh, the, the junior, Birkhoff Jr., um, which, I barely get into, I just, I just mentioned, because uh, I, uh, in my book, I stick very firmly to, as, as far as I can, to the maths that um, really impacted uh, on our lives. And, you know, I had an agenda there because I wanted to show that mathematics wasn't some abstruse activity that um, you could happily ignore. I mean, um, I was in a maths class once when um, the maths teacher was asked, what, what the good of we're learning all this maths was and he thought about it and he said well you can check your till receipt and I, I just thought this was such a depressingly bad answer um, that it's almost part of the reason that I wrote this book because uh, maths is kind of you know it's a language that runs through everything you know the algorithms that rule our lives you know even the way that we think about human happiness is um, you can you could uh, and historians have traced this back to utility theory, right? Um, so, you know, I had an agenda there, so I didn't really look at, at that, but uh, I think exactly. you know something of Holmos. Yeah, no, so yeah. Holmos was uh, a postdoc with uh, 
von Neumann. So actually, my next question is related to something I read in Paul Mosche's article on von Neumann. So, but he quotes Ulam uh, saying that von Neumann's uh, way of doing or thinking was oral, that is sound. I mean, his thinking was based on sound. Now, is this, I'm surprised at that, given that in your book, you say that he was not particularly good at music. No, um, he loved listening to it, but um, uh, he used to take, uh, was it cello lessons? I think I said cello lessons, but then um, his parents discovered that the only reason that he was playing scales was that he would have a book on the music stand. He would just play scales over and over again. He also, also the other thing that comes up is chess. He wasn't very good at chess. He was interested in it. He tried playing it, but he was never a very competent player. I don't, um, I don't know what I mean by that. Yes. So Oral. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, there are mathematicians who say they think in pictures. Yeah, but uh, he was he he never did that. He his he he was a very um, he he did, he said um, he criticized um, Bernowski, I think it was once uh, as a biologist for saying, you know, don't try and imagine this problem, don't try and picture this problem. That won't help you. You just need to go straight to the the maths. And so, you know, I think he, he thought very differently about things. He thought, like, uh, he didn't think in terms, of, if you're thinking about chess, he didn't think in terms of uh, spatially at all. He, he, would just, um, he would just take the logic out of it and just think in terms of moves, almost like the, uh, you know, the, yeah, basically, yeah. Except a computer that could solve theorems. <laughs> which, uh, yeah. is, uh, uh, just one more question before I let the audience come in. Uh, uh, Holmush says that, so he talks about what explains the success of von Neumann. And he said it was probably the axiomatic method. And uh, so, but he makes it clear that in von Neumann's hands, it was not pedantry. The method revealed to him the path to get from the foundations to the applications. He argued axiomatically, but Behave, the axiomatic method behaved differently in his hands. That's a lovely description, yeah. But uh, as you, since we are trying to assess von Neumann's legacy, the notion of scientific discovery itself has been changing rapidly now. Uh, we have machine learning, AI, et cetera. And uh, this notion of axiomatic principled study or discovery is uh, receiving some amount of beating, the way computers are now able to discover things which are somehow unexplained by them. Yeah. So uh, has this come up in your discussion with scientists? Uh, uh, not, not yet. I mean, I know of this black box problem with AI, which is, you know, it might solve a problem, but you don't really understand what it's done. You've just got the answer, right? And um, I know that there are some computer scientists who are sort of trying to peer into the black box and figure out what's going on. Um, it's, it's a test of science in a way, but we are, we're kind of used to this because in a sense, quantum mechanics is quite like that because what we have is we have a system of mathematics that we know works, but what it tells us about the physical world is still something of a mystery. It tells us all sorts of stuff. So, uh, some of it's contradictory. And uh, Einstein was always, of course, deeply troubled by this, although von Neumann uh, much less so. He was just happy that they had the maths and it all worked. Um, so I, I don't know. It may, I mean, it may force us to be a bit more honest uh, in facing the world as scientists, because, you know, uh, is, you know, what level of explanation are we looking for? And if you, if you look at science uh, through the ages, we, we tell ourselves that we're looking for physical explanation, but often what we're actually doing is trying to make predictive um, algorithms or predictive maths that, that um, use the data that we have, especially in physics and stuff like that, um, to, to make predictions. And, um, you know, what they tell you, I mean, we're bumping into the very extremes, really, of, of that approach in... I think particle physics and those sorts of areas. So it's all coming at the same time, isn't it? Uh, so, yes. uh, are there questions from the audience? Uh,
Hello, yes. Uh, many thanks uh, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, what I want to say is that although I never met von Neumann because the first time I came to the United States, he was already dead. I did meet a lot Mandelbrot who was closely associated to him, who told me many very interesting things. In particular, in the late 60s, he gave me a paper at the time, more or less classified, it would not stay like that for long, uh, which is particularly interesting about turbulence and numerical simulation. Actually, I have a whole, uh, a whole page in my book taken literally from uh, the von Neumann's things. And uh, certainly Mandelbrot never thought that he was sharper than von Neumann. That was clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thanks very much. I, I actually uh, mentioned Malnubro's association because, uh, again, von Neumann plays an important role in inviting him to the Institute for Advanced Study. And it turned out, uh, Mandelbro said years later, that um, long after he'd left his, you know, this one year at the IAS, that he was um, running into problems with his boss, I believe. It was like, it was up, you know, 20 years after von Neumann was dead, I think. And um, he went to people in other, in, in universities, he was working, and, um, and he, he went looking for positions. And they said, ah, yes, Mandelbro, um, von Neumann warned us that you may run into trouble because what you're working on is revolutionary um, and, and you'd probably need help. So, you know, he had prepared the ground for Mandelbro two day, you know, uh, two decades earlier before he died because he, he saw that Mandelbro might need help. And that's the sort of person I think von Neumann was, actually. He, uh, you know, he always had one eye to the future, you know, helping, helping anybody that he, he could, really. Um. So uh, when uh, von Neumann moved to the US in the late 20s, it was not yet the thing that most Jewish people were doing, right? So what made him sense that a world war was coming and all the rest of it? Um, yeah, this is an extremely difficult question. We know that in his childhood, the family you know, frequently worried about pogroms and stuff against Jewish people. Um, in Europe, there was, um, well, it must have seemed like paranoia at the time, but there was um, a feeling, a foreboding um, that something terrible was going to happen. But von Neumann went well beyond that in his letters, and he predicted kind of the shape of the political catastrophe to come. And I have no idea how he pieced that together, but we know from his letters that he did so. And um, of course, he was absolutely devastated by what the Nazis did, um, uh, not just to his, you know, his distant friends or relatives and some of his relatives, but also to what he saw as this perfect intellectual climate in Central Europe and in Germany, which the Nazis absolutely destroyed. And this, um, this made him very cynical about human nature, but, um, uh, you know, in these letters, he's worrying, but he's still a relatively optimistic individual. But after what happened during the Second World War, there's definitely this very cynical side of him that he's lost. But as to how he managed to make those predictions, I think it's worthwhile remembering that he did get it wrong the next time, because after the Second World War, he was predicting there'd be a Third World War, a nuclear conflagration, right, within a decade. As soon as the Soviet Union you know, had the bomb, that would be the end of the road. And so this is why he very famously um, pushed for a preemptive strike on the Soviet Union. Now, I think it's also important to remember he wasn't alone in doing this. 
at the time. I mean, I suppose that pacifist Bertrand Russell was also cheerfully saying, if the, if the Soviet Union doesn't give up you know, its atomic ambitions, we should just, you know, America should just bomb them. So, um, and, you know, there are some people now looking at the situation in Ukraine and thinking, well, you know, maybe you had a point. Um, but um, uh, this idea of a sort of multipolar world is, I think, going out of, uh, going out of style quite quickly at the moment. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I think whilst he did get it right, and it's quite remarkable that he got it right, we have to remember that he got it wrong the next time. And we are very lucky that he did. And uh, but you can imagine the sort of certainty it must have given him, right? So he'd made this accurate prediction before about the disaster. Then he lived through this horrible, disastrous war where millions of uh, Jews were also um, killed. And then um, he predicts he's sure that there's going to be a third world war. So it gives you a kind of uh, confidence that um, he, he didn't have. probably know a lot about personality of the gentleman. I want to ask about personality rather than uh, his achievements. So there are some reports, as far as I know, that he was quite arrogant and a rude person. And this remark about uh, bombing prim kind of country with atomic bombing, it kind of goes in the same direction. So is there any truth in it? And say, for example, what was his relation with Edward Teller, another of Martian? And, uh, and finally, did he have any regrets when Nagasaki was bombed because he was participating in this bomb? So did he think yeah. any time about that? You're going to have to remind me of these different points because um, um, they're, uh, they're all really interesting questions. And some of that is covered in the book, um, which I hope you'll read. But um, von Neumann, as I said, was this sort of very sort of central European character. And he was used to this idea that you you share, you go to cafes, you talk about your work, you exchange ideas, okay? And um, he was generous with his time and he expected other people to be generous uh, with their time and to cite him and give him credit just as much as he gave them credit. And when they didn't, he would get very, very angry and annoyed. And so he defended his invention of game theory quite strongly, for example, against, um, no, no, uh, game theory. Um, sorry, the Frenchman, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. Um, because uh, von Neumann had actually solved the Minimax theorem. So von Neumann laid claim to, to game theory, but there was a French mathematician, Borel, that's it, who um, uh, other French people were trying to give credit for. Now, I think von Neumann got it completely right because without Minimax, nothing stands up. So von Neumann's correct on that score, but he took great umbrage when another, I think a French math mathematician and historian tried to give credit to Borel for inventing game theory. Now, when he went to America, he found that people weren't necessarily as, um, as fair-minded as he was about credit. And his first bad experience of this, when he was, um, I think, still barely 30, maybe, maybe just 30, um, was with uh, Birkhoff Sr. and the ergodic theorem, right? So he turned up at a dinner at uh, Princeton and he had already um, got, uh, and I'm not a, a mathematician, so you'll have to excuse my uh, approximations, but he had some form of the ergodic theorem. And Birkhoff was aware of this, he'd been made aware of this, and he built on this quite quickly, I think to a more general um, ergodic theorem. And, uh, and von Neumann went to him and said, well, would you mind, you know, I got to this a little bit earlier than you, how about we publish together? And Birkhoff just basically said no. And von Neumann was taken aback by this. And um, he, he was stunned and he never really forgave Birkhoff, although, you know, he was magnanimous enough to then become good friends with Birkhoff's son and they, and they published together. And, and whilst he did get angry, you have to remember that there was the flip side. He understood Gödel's first incompleteness theorem before anybody else. He was at the meeting where um, Gödel unveiled his uh, proof of the completeness of the of first order logic. And there Gödel drops a heavy hint um, that he's got the first 
in completeness theorem. And nobody else in the room just you know, apparently took any notice. Well, Neumann talks to him after the concert, takes him aside, after the concert, after the, uh, the, the lecture, takes him aside, talks to him, and then he goes away and he writes to uh, Gödel a few months later saying, I've come across a remarkable consequence of your theorem, which is blah, 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 blah. And he tells him his second incompleteness theorem. And um, we don't have the letter that uh, Gödel sent back to him, but we have von Neumann's response, which is, um, as you humbly submit that you, are, that you are working on this and that you're well on the way, I will step back. Now, I've been informed by a sort of am amateur historian who's been looking at um, some of the documents surrounding um, the scholarship um, and this is quite recent, it was after the book was published, a few of these papers have come out, that in fact von Neumann was much further along in his proof of the second incompleteness theorem than Gödel was um, at this stage. And if that's true, it should really be called the uh, Gödel von Neumann incompleteness theorem, but perhaps we don't need another thing to name um, after von Neumann. So, uh, you know, there were both sides were, were there, and I've completely forgotten the second part of your question, I'm sorry, would you mind? Teller, yeah, Teller was one of his best friends, but Teller was a bit of a lunatic. Um, so Teller loved bombs and he loved um, his hydrogen bomb, the super. The super's design was flawed. And um, even von Neumann considers him something of an extremist. And when Teller attacked Oppenheimer, uh, von Neumann was very upset about this because he defended Oppenheimer at the trial. Now, we've got a film coming out about Oppenheimer, uh, about Oppenheimer by Christopher Nolan. He's one of my favorite directors, um, but I can bet your bottom dollar he's not gonna show von Neumann. And yet von Neumann's um, testimony on behalf of Oppenheimer, you know, that was one of the things that nearly shifted it in favor of Oppenheimer because um, von Neumann was seen as totally loyal to the US. So when he came in and basically he, 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 he essentially put the prosecution to shame a little bit, um, uh, it was seen as very important, sorry. Is it documented that von Neumann supported Oppenheimer? Yes, yes, it is, very much so. Uh, we can now get the entire transcripts of that trial. And there was a play actually made of that um, trial. So I have no idea what, um, uh, what is going to be made of this in the film. Um, I fear that Oppenheimer is going to be shown as a wronged hero who regretted. Oh, and somebody asked me about his regret. Um, now, his daughter, his own daughter, um, didn't really believe that he was, um, he regretted um, the bombing. And certainly he carried on working on um, atom bombs. And he actually realized the Soviet Union was ahead um, on developing hydrogen bombs small enough to fit on a missile. So he knew they were ahead on the intercontinental ballistic missile front. So he told um, the US government, he told RAND, um, he was on the TPOC committee. And as a result, the US kick-started its own I, you know, ICBM program. Um, now, we know the other side of that from Clara Dan, his second wife's diaries, where she describes um, one night where von Neumann comes home from Los Alamos, goes to bed and then wakes up um, after having slept for 12 hours, which she'd never seen him do. And he starts blithering and, you know, and, uh, and talking rapidly about uh, the imminent doom of the human race and how um, the, the, uh, the nuclear bombs that they were building would make scientists the most feared, but also the most wanted um, people in the world. And then he goes on to talk about how computers would be even worse. Uh, and now we have Facebook, we know that he was right. And um, so, um, uh, yeah, I, I think he was troubled, but he, he suppressed it um, to an extent because he felt it was his duty to keep, you know, the, the, the biggest democracy on the planet, the only opposition um, to the Soviet Union. And he saw, uh, you know, his, science, his scientific friends, some of them on the left, to have been hoodwinked really by the picture um, that was coming out of the Soviet Union of, of, of communism. So he was determined to kind of help the United States. So uh, we're running out of time, but uh, I have been given a question. Uh, 
which has been asked on the internet uh, by somebody. Now, this is a question that occurred to me. I mean, I must confess that while reading your book, I felt like a little child reading, I mean, at, at an adult movie and not finding his favorite characters in the book. Flawed Shannon. Yeah. So the question is, can you please explain the relationship between Claude Shannon and uh, uh, von Neumann? Uh, the notion of entropy that we now regard as Shannon entropy. The word entropy was apparently suggested to Shannon by von Neumann. And uh, uh, apparently so, and I, I, I found this out later, I'm afraid um, there were elements I mean, there were, there were simply elements that I couldn't cover. And we know that Shannon has his own book, right? Uh, now, Mind of Play, which I haven't read, um, but which is on my list, and it's on my sort of e-reader. Um, I had heard that von Neumann uh, told him he should call it entropy and gave him a couple of uh, good reasons. But uh, that and then von Neumann's own von Neumann entropy and uh, his contributions to quantum theory afterwards through uh, Wigner was something I would have liked to have explored, but I ran out of money, and um, uh, it was uh, the book was written during uh, COVID. I had one year, um, my the first part of my advance run out, so I was broke, and uh, my wife was keeping us afloat at the time, and she's um, she's a senior lecturer in history, so you can imagine <laughs> that this was not necessarily there. So I felt that what I'd constructed there was kind of a decent sort of arc um, through eight different subjects, which um, for many people is already too much. So information theory, I didn't want to <laughs> open up another can of worms. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we are running out of time. The turbulence program has been kind to us to accommodate us, but they have something scheduled at 4.45. So um, let's thank the speaker. And the book is available outside, as is high tea. So I invite all of you there. Please buy the book. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya is happy to sign it for you. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so one final pleasant duty. Uh, may I give this to you on behalf of ICTS? Uh, thank you. Thank you.